And yes, you've come to the right place. You are listening to Three Women. We are so very live. We have a studio fil filled with amazing women from a uh, multi-faith background. And we're going to be talking uh, about poverty. But first, we're going to be talking about these amazing women because they represent so much. And of course, I'm your host, Sherry DeNovo. I'm the MPP for Parkdale High Park. And we are interested in you too. So if you want to phone in, it's 416-946-7000. If you're the retiring and shy type and you just want to tweet at me, I'm happy to take those tweets and tweet you back. And that's at Sherry DeNovo, so at C-H-E-R-I-D-I-N-O-V-O, -O, here live on Three Women. And we're going to start with Karen Robbins. Now, let me tell you what her bio says. She's, a, first of all, a Jewish woman, one of the co-founders of the Danforth Multi-Faith Community Group. Uh, and this is a group that eight years ago came together to promote harmony between people of different faiths with a focus on issues of social justice. They've held many grassroots community peace walks that take people from church to synagogue to mosque to share time together and be hosted in each other's places of worship. Welcome to Three Women, Karen. Thank you. Nice so, to be here. So let's talk a little bit more, first of all, about the Danforth Multi-Faith Community Group, because honestly, it's the first time I've heard about it and first time many of our listeners have, have heard about it. And it sounds amazing. So yes. um, tell us a little bit more. So a bit of the background. Around eight years ago, we actually... Um, we approached the late Jack Layton and Peter Tabbins in our neighborhood because we're all based on, in the Danforth area, all of our faith communities. And um, at the time, it was very much, I'm from the Danforth Jewish Circle, and we wanted to connect more with the Muslim community within our neighborhood. Um, and it was, it was actually lovely at the time because um, both Peter and Jack introduced us to um, the Pakistani Community Center. And at the time, um, one of the, uh, the person running it, and still is, is Mrs. Taslim Riaz. Um, we'll meet her daughter shortly. Um, but uh, Taslim and myself really were co-founding this group. Um, and what was interesting is the Pakistani Community Center, which she was um, uh, representing and supporting people in her community, um, was based in Glen Rhodes United Church, which is in Little India on Gerard Street East. Um, our synagogue, the Danforth Jewish Circle, was also on the Danforth um, uh, in the Danforth area at Danforth and Chester in East Minster. United Church. So here we were, um, a Muslim uh, faith community and a Jewish faith community being hosted by the United Church. So um, we got... very United Church. It was very United <laughs> Church. And certainly uh, the Reverend at the time at Glen Rhodes and uh, Sarah Borsia Miller, who's the Reverend at Eastminster, got a great giggle always telling people that it was the Muslims and the Jews that wanted to be together, and they're just coming along for the ride. <laughs> Um, so initially, we did these community uh, peace walks. Um, we were inspired by a visiting rabbi that came to us, Rabbi Lynn Gottlieb from Albuquerque, who had started these peace walks after 9-11 in the States. They were in 17 cities in the United States where... Um, Basically, the Jewish community and the Muslim community would try to come together and do a peace walk, inviting everyone in the community to walk from mosque to synagogue to church and just to spend time in each other's communities and to walk together. Um, very basic design. And of course, uh, for us, uh, at the end, there was always food and refreshments. And I found out that's not just a Jewish thing. <laughs> Everybody loves the refreshments. We've always had great refreshments. Um, that said, uh, so we've done several of those, but we've really gotten to know one another over the years, I would say, and, and done some really interesting things together. Thanks, Karen. And, and our other guest here, of course, Seda Riaz, and is a young Muslim woman, a law student who's actively participated in the Danforth multi-faith community as well, since you were a teenager. Um, uh, again, your background is bridging communities and grassroots community work. And I, I, you've been on the show before. I yes. remember talking about Sisters to Sisters <laughs> campaign. Um, and also, of course, a political activist. And you ran as a candidate in, in Don Valley West. And I remember that well as well. So Seda, welcome to Three Women. So, uh, so tell me about your your involvement with the Danforth uh, Center, but also just where you're at in the faith spectrum. Um, so I was um, automatically, when I was young, kind of brought into uh, the Danforth multi-faith. And I didn't quite understand it at the time, um, but 
um, you know, being under the influence of uh, the women who organized this, like Karen Robbins, uh, Evelyn Stein, um, and Tasim Raz, my mom, um, it really opened my mind. It opened up my perspective, and it made me more involved not only in the Danforth multi-faith, but it allowed me to be more open-minded to different communities and to kind of reach out to uh, different communities. Um, <clears throat> Because of that past experience or continuous experience, um, I don't limit myself only now to the Danforth. I also go uh, to, I'm currently working uh, or kind of um, helping out uh, in Scarborough Rouge River in the uh, Tamil community. So it, it, it completely opens up your mind. This small group that started eight years ago uh, completely changed my perspective uh, as a person. And on top of that, how I put, uh, put out uh, or put out my work um, in other communities because of what I've learned uh, from the Danforth multi-faith uh, group. Now, Karen is part of a Jewish um, circle that worships um, out of the Danforth, uh, on the Danforth. Are you part of a Muslim gr uh, a mosque as well, or how does that? So I'm not, uh, I don't live on the Danforth, mm -hmm. but we've always been uh, involved in the Danforth. Uh, I haven't really, I'm not that connected to the Medina Mosque, but there's a mosque in our community, mm -hmm. which is in the Don Valley West, uh, that we're more connected to where we go on religious holidays okay, and, you know, stuff like that. But um, it, it's, it's a funny how all people of faith get a little guilty when you ask about this. <laughs> it's sort of like Christians who, well, I, they're Christmas and Easter, you know. Anyway, so yeah, don't feel guilty about <laughs> not going to the mosque. This is, Thank it's you. All, it's all okay. It's all okay. Just, but, I, but I'm interested just in the, in, uh, and listeners would be in the connections here. Um, thanks, Ada. And finally, we've got Beth Baskin. Again, she's been on the show, and so has your daughter. It's a family affair. Um, United Church's Social Justice Project, and uh, Beth is the Christian in the crowd, and staff member for Social Justice Project Toronto Southeast Presbytery, part of the United Church. Uh, and you've worked with the Anglican United and, Ecunem and of course, all church contexts for 30 years. So welcome, Beth, again to Three Women. Thank you. It's so how, tell here. me about your connection with these two women. Well, I the Social Justice Project itself has been around for about five years, but being a social justice project, we get sort of tucked into little corners. And so my church my first office was in was sold. The church my, my office was in second was Eastminster United, which is now being redeveloped to be accessible. And so my office is now at Glen Rhodes. And so Glen Rhodes, um, Anne, who's been part of the multi-faith group, had been talking about the campaign and, and knew that I was now housed at Glen Rhodes and said, how about you come to this meeting with me and let's talk about what the Danforth Multi-Faith Group is doing. And, and I know you've been doing a ton of work around poverty issues, both in the city and, and at both the provincial and national level. So how, how can we connect with some of the work you've been doing? And, and so one lovely day in the summertime, we went over to Karen's house and talked about what poverty was looking like and what the campaign possibilities were. So, And have you also yeah. taken part in these walks and some of the... Not yet. Yeah. This will be my first time. Uh, so, I okay. mean, it's it's one of those things which I have heard of sort of tangentially because of connections, but I've never, never been part of it. So this is my... I'm the newbie. Okay. Well, to get back to the Danforth multi-faith community, and if you've just tuned in, you're listening to three women, and we, in fact, have uh, three other women in the studio. We go to Full House today, uh, and uh, all representing different faiths and different faith perspectives. We're going to be talking about poverty and social justice, of course, but right now, I'm just fascinated about the multi-faith aspect, and I'm sure listeners are too. Um, and again, a uh, tweet for sure at uh, C-H-E-R-I-D-I-N-O-V-O -E -O if you have any comments or want to get become part of the conversation. Um, now, just to focus on the two of you for a second, because we are the, the newspapers are full of how you're not supposed to get along, Muslims <laughs> and Jews. Um, I mean, that's all we read about, really. Um, of course, centered on Israel and whatever Israel's doing in, in that moment. But uh, but surely when you go back to your communities, I'm not talking just about the Danforth multi-faith community, but your Jewish communities, your Muslim communities, did people ever say, what are you doing, like, with them? <laughs> would you like to go, Karen? Yeah, I could go first. Mm -hmm. um, it's interesting that you raise that. I would say that's probably what got me so interested in doing this kind of work, because I was so concerned and quite frankly depressed about the situation that I thought um, my boys I have three boys they were younger at the time and I thought you know why can't we just know our neighbors 
you know, it, it's, so, it's so easy within the context of where we live in a downtown neighborhood. Um, you know, it's, it's rosy on the outside that we all see each other, but it, would it be that hard to actually just start to do some community events together? Um, and it just meant doing the events. It didn't mean that we would be discussing politics or just getting to know each other, just going for a walk with someone, hearing what their concerns are, um, and getting to know each other. And that's what it's been. And I think the most important thing is that we've continued to develop relationships over time, like anything in life, mm -hmm. right? So that as far as when people might say that to me, I would say, why don't you just come out for a walk sometime? Just have a walk. Just meet some people. People are more than, made, you know, we're all, you know, we all have certain biases or prejudices or views of things. Um, but when you just walk with someone on a, on a nice sunny day from a mosque to a church to a synagogue um, with well-meaning people that, that believe that it's just okay for us to spend some time together and put all those other ideas aside, it's kind of wonderful what can happen. Mm -hmm. So, What about you, Sada? Do you have to answer to anybody about this? <laughs> what do they say when well, you tell them? Yeah, it's just I think that uh, what you guys started, like uh, Evelyn Stein, uh, Karen Robbins, and Tassim Riaz, I think the initial step, you know, everyone thinks what they they don't know about something, uh, they're a bit he hesitant. I don't think that they were because they're so progressive, but I think, uh, you know, a anyone in the community, or any, w whether it's race, whether it's mm -hmm. culture, whether it's religion, if if you don't know about something, you're a bit hesitant, but that doesn't mean that you're unwilling to learn. And I feel like that's what it was for a lot of people. Once we got to know each other, it wasn't like, okay, now we know you guys, we don't want to be part of this. No, it, it, it was like, we know you guys and we want to do more and we want to learn more. And it's just taking that first initial step and I don't think it's people in general. People, you know, we love each other. We care about each other. I think it's, you know, I'm sorry to say, but I think it's the media and I think it's how, you know, we're portrayed or just people in general. I'm not talking about Muslim, but mm -hmm. just people and groups in general, how they're portrayed in the media. Um, I think a little bit of knowledge goes a long way. And uh, yeah. it's, it's, it's nice to have, and, and Beth, you can jump in here. Uh, it's nice to have a, a safe place place to ask stupid questions really <laughs> about each other's faiths and things because we know so little about each other's faiths and we all, and a lot of us just see what's given to us um through the mainstream and 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 i, I found like after you mentioned 9 11 and and when i back in the days when i was in the pulpit in the united church um right after 9 11 we had a mosque jamming mosque which is up the street from our church we invited them to come and worship with us the next that very Sunday, a whole wow. busload came. We didn't expect that. Um, and nobody had ever been in church before. And most of the people that were in our church had never actually sat down with a Muslim before and talked to them. And then out of that came kind of a study group. And um, and that was the real icebreaker was you can ask any stupid question. <laughs> Nobody's going to hate you for it. Just ask you know, what tip of the tongue kind of questions. And uh, most of them got a giggle or a laugh if they were stupid because some of them were <laughs> you know but then that opened up the conversation so then you could actually converse instead of just being polite what do you think Beth you've, you've been involved well, in multi-faith circles for a while yes well one of the delights was when we met at Karen's house Karen as as she intimated a little bit as a good Jewish woman who really loves to feed and and <laughs> care for us and we were in the middle of Ramadan when we met in the summertime. And so she had carefully put out the refreshments, and the, but, but they were in the kitchen so that, that uh, Saeed and Tazleem didn't have to see us. If we yeah, needed to eat or drink, <laughs> we, we could go and, and do it in the kitchen. And so that, for me, coming in as a newcomer to the meeting, was just a delightful sense of what it is to accommodate one another and how we find ways um, to, to share our commonalities rather than get fixated on our differences. I mean, the, there's that lovely poster with all the golden rules on it mm -hmm. of the various faiths. And it's really true that that whole sense of, you know, do unto others as you would have them do unto you is just said in different ways in all of our faiths. And there is no question about figuring out how to work together when it comes to caring for one another. Mm -hmm. And and there may be a little bit of dancing as we figure out what that <laughs> looks like, but it it's definitely a delight to be with a group, especially a group like this that's already been formed for a while, and so they know how to be with one another and how to make things happen. So Karen, you were itching to jump in there. I saw it about the stupid questions. 
Well, it, it, it's just funny because um, very much from the, I would say from the beginning, there were a few meetings where we realized it was Ramadan and we had a lot of food in front of us. And I felt absolutely <laughs> terrible, like just so terrible. Um, uh, and another example is we're planning, um, Beth can tell us more about this anti-poverty chew on this event we're planning, but it happens to fall on a Jewish festival called Sukkot. So we met as a group last year to plan this. So we're going to um, accommodate to it by the chew on this main event is really on Monday the 17th of October but we're going to do our walk on the 16th where that evening Sukkot starts but we're actually Sukkot is our Jewish Thanksgiving and uh, we put tents in our backyards and uh, we're actually going to end our walk in the Jewish sukkah uh, of the Danforth Jewish Circle, where not only our rabbi Miriam Margles will meet everyone, but so will the reverends and the imam, and everyone will will share in conversation about Thanksgiving and how to think about poverty and hunger. So, mm-hmm. and what about you, Saida? Were there any? Okay, just you're the, you're the young one in the room. Were there any <laughs> stupid questions you always wanted to ask a Jew or a, que- a Christian and were just too embarrassed <laughs> to? Here's your chance. Oh man! <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, did anything like that come up? <laughs> uh no I man I don't know like I I feel like I I'm put on the spot like no, I no, can't no, think of something no, no, right no. now you don't have to think of a question I was only half joking yeah, yeah. but I mean but <laughs> but did it, in in the getting used to being with somebody who you know I mean come on there have been some historical problems yeah but the thing is and that's the beauty of maybe I got lucky in that aspect but I was raised in that environment where you know I didn't think about you know I accepted whatever the difference were this differences were and uh, you know uh, maybe to gain knowledge yeah sure but I never thought of it in that way that okay we have our differences um, I don't know maybe it was just the environment that I was raised in that I never thought of that in that way mm-hmm. so, I don't know. Well, you're one of the lucky ones yeah so, uh, yeah <laughs> I, can, I can tell you that at those evenings in our church there were a lot of stupid questions asked <laughs> but it, it it was good you know because people got their prejudices out there and sometimes you know, they, well, we can certainly see south of the border, they can take very ugly forms if they're not actually discussed and, and we can't get them into the open air. And, I, you know, not to harbor that, but I, I think, you know, it's amazing in this city. I, I always look at Bayview as an example. We've got, you know, you've got a temple, you've got a synagogue, you've got a mosque, you've got a church. It's all on the same stretch. And there are not too many places in the world that that is possible. So the fact that you're building on that is really quite impressive. Um, any? Do you ever get into the political fights? So I've got to ask. Like, do you have, I mean, come on, Israel. We all share Israel yeah. Um, yeah. in some way, shape, or form. Do you ever get into the political? We, we. Um, I would say we try not to. I mean, that's not the point of why we come together. It doesn't mean that friendships haven't developed so that we can share our views on things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of trust there now. But in terms of the kind of events and community awareness we try to do and community building, we try to focus it on events that work for the community. So one example is early on in our relationship, um, Tasleem mentioned to me that for a lot of the women in her community, um, they're newer immigrants um, at a different socioeconomic level um, than more you know, um, more, you know, gentrified, let's say, um, uh, Jewish folks that I would know in my in my neighborhood. And she said that it's hard for them to get away from home um, and that it would be better if we were to do events all women. So Sisters to Sisters was born as a campaign. And so we supported, um, it was very interesting for us because we thought, oh, study group or what. She said, no, let's bring all of our women together. Let's share our food. Let's share our music. Let's just spend time together. And we've done several events that way. Um, a, a, several years ago, we did one just after Eid where Taslim went out to the country. I don't know if Saida helped and got a, a goat and made an amazing goat stew in a big cauldron. Um, we were in the Pakistani Community Center in the basement of Glen Rhodes. And um, us, the Jewish women, we were braiding challah bread, for our, our Sabbath bread. And um, our United Church friends, the women were all making fabulous Christmas cookies. And everyone, all the women were going to all of these different stations. So there was a lot of sharing and there was also music. And it, it was, was just a really good time. Yeah. So, sounds like the beginning of peace in our world in our time. <laughs> <laughs> sounds amazing. Um, Beth, so get, to get back to you, you've been on the poverty file for a long time in social justice work. So um, so first of all, give us a little bit of background about what the work that you do uh, in social justice and then right. 
we can go from there. Sure. Well, w my work is to work primarily with um, United Churches on the east half of the city because we have sort of interesting geographic boundaries when we go into the church mm -hmm. sometimes. Uh, but uh, how it cr was created was that one congregation, Fairlawn Avenue, felt that they had really solidified in their own social justice. So they wanted to see if they could support other churches in doing that. So they created the Social Justice Project out of some money that was made available through amalgamation. And so my task has really been to try and find ways to connect United Church congregations and United Church people with justice and, and um, advocacy opportunities. And so out of that, a number of churches have been engaged in the poverty issue and then they say how do we make partnerships so we've made partnerships in a number of ways with groups like put food in the budget and and citizens for public justice who have also been working a great deal on poverty and so um, and we've also right now at the city level been involved in commitment to community which has been doing a lot of work around the city-based poverty reduction strategy so I've ended up being engaged at city, province, and, and national level. And then Glenn Rhodes started to get connected to the Chew on This campaign a couple of years ago. And what is that? What is it? It is um, Dignity for All is a, a national organization that some of you will have heard of recently because they're the organization um, who the Canada Revenue Agency wants to take away, wanted to take away their charitable status because you cannot eradicate poverty. You can only alleviate poverty. And they had the eradication of poverty in their name. So um, there's been lots of juggling around that and some, some stuff. But essentially what it comes down to is that they want us as a country to look at a poverty reduction plan and a way of actually changing the systems um, that are in place that keep people poor. And so Four years ago, when we were still in, under the the uh, conservative government, they said, what creatively can we do um, to get people to pay attention to us? And they created Chew on This, which I know all of you can't see, but I have a paper bag. Um, and so what they did was they filled the paper bag with an apple and a little bit of information and said, we've created this poverty reduction plan. We want you to write to the government. We want you to tell folks that we need to change the system. And then a couple years later, they created these, these lovely magnets with a, a picture of a piece of bread on it. And it says one in eight households struggle to put food on the table. And although this is a couple years old, that statistic is pretty much still true to this day. And they creatively stand out on the street corner on the International Day for the Eradication of Poverty and hand these out and invite folks to sign postcards because one of our challenges is that although we recognize there's a huge number of Canadians who don't want to see people be poor, their voices aren't heard. And so trying to find ways to widen the circle which is exactly what the Danforth multi-faith group is about, to encourage more fo folks to raise their voices and to say, enough is enough, let's change the systems so that people are no longer poor or at least as desperately poor as our systems are currently keeping them. So on um, s October 17th, and then we're going to do this project on the 16th, um, there's going to be this opportunity for folks to really have have their voices heard and hopefully right now we seem to have a federal government who is pursuing a poverty reduction plan and is beginning to look at what that would look like. So we're hoping we're in a moment of opportunity where there's a chance for our voices to be heard and I'm just so excited that we're looking at, at distributing 600 of these or 500 of these bags and postcards and, and really encouraging folks to, to sign the postcards so that I'll take them away. Karen, <laughs> see that? <laughs> any comments on that? Oh, that's uh, that's a lot of information that she gave, covered everything. I, I don't know if I could add on to that. But I, I think it's exciting that we're getting together with a focus on this particular issue because it's something that we, from all these different faith backgrounds, different socioeconomic backgrounds, 
we can focus on something that we collectively want to mm -hmm. see happen from a social justice point of view. Mm -hmm. um, the, the, I, I mean, I'm, I'm going to play devil's advocate here. I'm just a cynical politician in the bunch. But I can, you know, having been there for 10 years and four elections later, and I can tell you there's less being done on poverty now than ever. Um, in fact, I just asked a question in the House this morning. There's 170,000 families in Ontario waiting an average of 10 to 12 years for affordable housing. Um, and the, this new damning statistic just came out. Over 50% of Canadians are one paycheck away from some disaster. So all and interest rates, are of course, at an all-time low. So all those condo towers that are south of China, I mean, a lot of people who live in those, they're not the poor you're speaking about, Beth, but you know, if those bumped up a point or two, that all be sliding into poverty too overnight. So it really is precarious. 50% of our jobs are precarious part-time contract jobs now in the province. Um, it's actually worse than it's ever been in historically since the you know Victorian era before social services of any sort kicked in. And yet there are so many good people like yourselves, so you know, doing all of this work. So I guess my question really is, okay, first of all, don't you feel like it's sort of you know, pushing this load uphill and you keep sliding back? Um, but second of all, why do you think that message is just not getting through to governments? What is it about, where's the disconnect here between all the people in all the faith communities saying the same thing, which pretty much everybody is, um, and all these organizations set up to combat poverty and yet we're not seeing the results. Karen, do you want to give Beth talk? Who wants to jump in? Oh, what can I say? Um, it's, it, it's the reality. The, the really tough things, they're not going to be solved overnight. And um, I think about you sitting in the house all these years and hearing this. And um, one thing I can say is that young blood like Saida gives me more hope. Um, when I see when I see that young people want to come out and help, um, we've actually gone out to all of our communities about our event on the 16th and and trying to get the you know we have a Jewish mm -hmm. school and there's you know um, different schools and youth uh, contingencies that are going to come out and make signs and just building awareness there. I mean, yes, this is a problem that is it's so frustrating and things just seem to be getting worse, but it. it what's the alternative that's how mm -hmm. i feel and the energy comes from us continuing to do this work and seeing young people joining us yeah beth well i think one of the the funny things um which you will appreciate was was last night my son was on with a friend and they were having to do an economic exercise in school and his friend said well minimum wage is is 11 25 and liam looks across the table at me and says 11:25. When did it get to that? Like he he he's been aware of that, but you know he remembers you know a few years ago when it was 10. So I mean, in terms of hope, the fact that we actually have a minimum wage that's indexed and mm -hmm. slowly crawling, and we know it, we all know it's not inadequate. It's not adequate, but at least there's some sense that we do we do make progress once in a while, and so we can look towards that. Um, I think that. What my hope is, is that I listen to politicians tell us that we can't raise taxes, that we can't seek new revenue tools. And the fact is, is that if we don't change our systems and if we don't do those two things, like charge me more tax and find ways to look at revenue tools that redistribute our income, we're going to lose, all of us are going to lose what we value in this city, in this province, in this country. And so I guess right now my task is just to figure out the couple of hundred voices that people currently hear need to be several thousand and hundreds of thousands. And so how do we just amplify what's already been there? I mean, you and I spoke when I started this job five years ago and could tell me how many times you'd had faith communities come to you and speak about any issue um, and it was a pretty small number of times and so trying to help folks to realize that it's not enough to do the good works it's not enough to have the food banks and the the meal programs but if there, we're not asking for the systems to change then um, it, gets, it gets assumed that we don't want our taxes raised. Mm -hmm. 
Well, on that note, um, by the way, you are listening to Three Women, your host, Sherry DeNovo. Uh, I'm here with three women, and they are Karen Robbins, uh, Saida Riaz, and Beth Baskin, representing Christian, Jew, and Muslim. And we're going to come back and talk to them about all things social justice and poverty and a little bit of faith thrown in there. But first, we've got to take a station break. Uh, and we're going to do that and listen to Zaki Ibrahim and Heartbeat. Toronto, the sound of your city. 
And we are back. Uh, three women. I'm your host, Sherry DeNovo, MPP Park, Delhi Park. And of course, again, you're always welcome if you have a question, you want to hear your voice on live radio, 416-946-7000. Our wonderful uh, tech and producer, Lisa Duchak, will take your call. Um, if you want to tweet, tweet too. I said at Sherry DeNovo, just uh, send it there. Uh, or, and of course, always Facebook for later reference. And thank you for those who have tweeted and those who are sending stuff into Facebook. Um, we're here in studio live, as I said, with Karen Robbins, um, part of the Jewish circle and part of the Danforth multi-faith community, uh, Saida Riaz, who's also part of that community, a young Muslim woman, and Beth Baskin, a Christian um, who works for the United Church in the social justice area. Uh, we left talking about poverty, and, uh, and it's interesting that the general attitude in polls is that this is not top of the mind issue for, for for many people, and I think many people are just frightened for their own their own rent, their own mortgage, their own lifestyle. Um, but uh, about six years ago, seven years ago, um, I traveled to Sweden as part of a parliamentary trip, and this is not just about Sweden. This is true, in fact, of a lot of Western Europe, um, particularly Scandinavian countries. But one could say from a North American perspective, they don't really have any poverty there. Now, of course, you can see a person every so often pushing a you know shopping cart around the street. Um, but this is a community of 9 million people in all of Sweden. They have built 100,000 new units of housing a year for 10 years. Everybody has a house, they have an 85% unionization rate, which is part of it. So even McDonald's workers are unionized. Um, so everybody has a house, um, social, free post-secondary, free childcare, more or less, uh, pharmacare. So all the basics are covered. So really in terms of our North American standards, they really don't have poverty. In fact, when a group of Swedes came over here from their parliament um, and they were working in the social justice area and social services, uh, our folk asked them what they'd like to see in Toronto, and they said, and, and our folks suggested, would you like to visit a food bank? And they, their response was, why do you keep your food in banks? They don't have food banks. And in fact, they didn't used to have food banks in Ontario. I remember when the first food bank happened. I grew up in the city of Toronto, and we never had food banks. I think we had one shelter. And that was under Tories, 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 Tories federal, provincial, and municipal. So to get, you know, it wasn't even a partisan issue. It's It was, to your point, Beth, higher taxes. Higher taxes um, paid for better social services was really what it came down to. Mm -hmm. um, but, I mean, to get back to why politicians don't act and why governments of all stripes don't do anything these days on this issue um, and amplifying this voice, what, you know, um, what do we do with the fact that when people talk to pollsters and pollsters influence politicians and po poverty is never top of mind issue for them. What do we do about that? You want to jump in? Beth? They're all looking at me. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think part of what I'm trying to do in, in my work is really to at least invite the folks that we are in community with to raise their voices. That that I think we are the good folk, good good people of faith who do the things to take care of those folks. And often I think we can get focused on doing the good works and aren't raising the voices. And so that's sort of the next step for me is to help folks to understand that we think this should change, but unless we're in putting our voices into the mix, into the conversation. So trying to, to give folks the tools, to give people the two or three lines to phone their counselor and say, look, I think we need an affordable TTC pass for people on fixed incomes. It's that easy. You pick up the phone, you call your counselor. That's that's how it happens. You, you sit down and you take two minutes to send an email to, to the minister or to your local um, member of parliament, whether it's provincial or federal, and you say, these are my concerns. Because what we get told is exactly that, that the polls don't reflect it, that the message isn't getting through. So, and it's not enough to simply have, quote, the usual suspects, of which I think I fall into one, as you note, I've been doing this work for a while. Um, but it's, it's, you know, it's my sister, it's my uncle, it's my aunt, it's my, you know, my friend down the street, regardless of, of what our faith or, or cultural backgrounds are. And it feels to me that as much as I 
don't think our poverty reduction strategies at any level are accomplishing what they try to accomplish, it does mean there's a little bit more of a conversation mm -hmm. happening. And the fact that the Danforth Multi-Faith Group even paid attention when Anne said, what about looking at poverty is a sign of hope for me that we can, you know, then walk down the street with aprons and signs and try and... And keep the issue alive. Yes. I, I mentioned uh, as the as the tune was on that, uh, you know, in, in Christian scripture, there's a line that Jesus says, you know, um, that, well, the poor you'll always have with you, which has been used not particularly constructively over the hundreds of years since uh, he said or didn't say it. Um, now, is there something like when you find when you look at your own scripture, uh, your own theological basis, like is there what are you what are you told by the Torah? What are you told by the Quran about poverty and what your your religious duties are around those who exist in poverty? Well, certainly in the Jewish religion, um, there is a focus on something called tikkun olam, which is to heal the world. Um, it is our, that is our, uh, certainly the, in Judaism, the, the way of looking at issues of social justice. And um, from all the Abrahamic religions, I think we have this idea of social justice. And one thing I wanted to mention in terms of feeling that one might get jaded that we're not being heard by, you know, our voices aren't being heard by politicians is, uh, you know, politicians are in a much, you know, they have all the, the pressure on them and the shorter cycle and the things that they're responding to and polls and whatnot. But by building relationships in our communities, I feel that it's, it's stronger and for the long term. It's, it, there's, there's more of a reality to it. And, uh, not wanting to generalize, but I wonder if as Canadians we feel a bit schizophrenic where we want to help, we want to heal, we want to take in all these Syrian refugees, but maybe we're afraid to think about what that will do in terms of poverty for other Canadians and how we might have to change the system. Um, but certainly I, I, the intent is there. I know for our group what we did um, actually last June after Ramadan, we were thinking that so many of these Syrian families have had such a hard time coming, um, the ones that have, have been able to come, and have certainly a lot have been privately sponsored, and there are all the, the government-assisted refugee groups, <clears throat> families that have come. But we took Eid gift baskets, and again, this was recommended by, you know, Saida and her mother Taslim, thinking about what it would be like for those families, their first Ramadan and their first Eid in Canada, just thinking about what they've been through. And we certainly hear about that on the news all the time, about the horrors that these people have been through. And all, you know, we, we thought we would want to do some kind of big event, and both um, Saida and her mother, uh, Taslim Riaz, said, why don't we just go with an Eid gift basket quietly to these people's homes? Um, you know, a Muslim woman, a Jewish woman, a Christian woman. It sounds like an opening for a joke. It does. <laughs> yeah. It does. Walk into a bar. And you know. it was actually um, incredible. Okay, we have a, we have a comment from a from a caller saying stop military spending. There's some way of getting uh, money into the poverty file. So, um, anybody want to deal with that one? <laughs> I think that might have been one of my friends. Uh, <laughs> I, I have several friends who talk about withholding their taxes and putting it into a peace fund instead of a military fund. So, I mean, I think it it is a question of what our values are and and that I would say I mean we need to figure out what we value and certainly I think buying incredibly new helicopters and submarines and some of those big spending things that we're talking about need to be questioned more thoroughly when we're looking at folks who are I mean we're going to step out of this lovely brick building and not go too far before we find somebody who's begging for money and sleeping on the street tonight. Mm -hmm. And and Karen you talking about um I mean uh, what 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 the tradition has been of Takoon and I always think of that wonderful Michael Lerner's wonderful publication coming out of the States, just yes, about to read Kuhn. his latest book. Um, and by the way, if you're listening, read uh, Tikkun. You can find it online um, my, at Michael Lerner. It's a wonderful publication that comes out from the States. But um, uh, it, one of the things, another thing that Jesus said is fear not. And the, the, the reality is I think a lot of Canadians are living in fear. They're, they're fearful about their own futures. And it's very difficult when you're frightened 
to be generous. Like it's, you tend to want to keep things in or hoard things or, you know, we're big. And the, and the news tends to keep us frightened. But I mean, also, just the economic system keeps us frightened. What do you think, um, uh, Saidi, about that, the comment from the, the caller who said, uh, stop military spending? What does it mean for somebody of your generation when you hear that? Uh, I think that uh, it's an appropriate, you know, uh, remark to make or comment to make. Um, you know, instead of um, instead of going into that, uh, we just had a, an arms deal with Saudi Arabia, which I think was completely unnecessary. Shocking. Shocking. And I, I think it's a lame excuse to say that it couldn't be canceled or whatever because, um, you know, Saudi Arabia is known to violate human rights. Uh, when it comes to people and it comes to a piece of contract, I think people's lives should be valued over a piece of contract. Um, and I think it's it's very important uh, to to have, you know, the, it should have been done differently. And I think for my, for me as a Muslim as well, um, although Saudi Arabia is a Muslim country, um, I think that a lot of the human rights violations that they have over there goes against Islam as well, which I don't agree with. And I'm very vocal about it, even with my friends. Um, and I, you know, it, when that deal went through, I, I was really upset and I, I couldn't, I couldn't believe that, you know, um, you know, the Canadian government would go through with that. I thought that, you know... And are your friends in agreement? Uh, in agreement with that? Yeah, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. like, um, I've had a friend um, from Saudi Arabia who is here studying, and I brought that up to her, and she completely agreed with me on that on that matter. And, uh, you know, knowing that the new government coming in, we had different types of hopes that, you know, this deal wouldn't go through, and, you know, there would be some sort of, uh, you know, kind mm -hmm. of <laughs> cut off right there. But unfortunately, it didn't happen the way... Yeah, I mean it's an interesting it's an interesting point, Karen. Did you, you didn't weigh in on the militarism comment? That uh, what do you think? Yeah, um, obviously in terms of looking at ways in which we can um, there, there's stuff that can be re redistributed, absolutely. Um, and I, I would say the real genesis of how our group came together was just redistributing how we think about things and not being quite so insular. Mm -hmm. um, that's a different kind of redistribution, but it's just thinking because polls do make you th and the media do make you feel fearful and want to protect what's yours and what's your own. And how can we really do that if, you know, how can we really go out and help all these Syrian refugees or um, without kind of stopping and saying, we can solve this together collectively and yes our voices do need to be heard. To Beth's point, mm -hmm. um, our voices do need to be heard. Um, and by the way, uh, out there in, in Radio Land, we do have a, a Jew, a Christian, and a Muslim all sitting around the table at Three Women. And if you want to add your voice to theirs, 416-946-7000. If you want to add to the other caller and phone in and any question or comment on uh, what do we do about poverty, which is the overall topic, but also multi-faith work as well. Um, so, I mean, going forward... Uh, you know, it's hard not to feel jaded and it's hard not to feel, you know, frustrated on this issue because we've been doing it for so long and we haven't had a lot of results. And in fact, we've kind of institutionalized food banks now and institutionalized shelters, etc. Um, one of the interesting things that has shifted a little bit, I think, is, and Beth, you could probably speak to this, is the Out of the Cold program. Remember, every church mm -hmm. and its mother had an Out of the Cold program. And, and I think most churches and synagogues also who have these programs, um, um, I'm not sure about mosques, but I know synagogues and churches had them where basically it'd open up and then people could sleep there and stay there. Um, and, and churches finally just said, enough, we can't do this anymore. We don't have the volunteer base. We don't have the expertise. We don't have the money. And I think the other thing that kind of came out in the discussions was, and we're putting a Band-Aid on what government should be mm -hmm. doing. Um, it's hard to make that call because if somebody's hungry, you want to feed them. You kind of want to do both. Um, what are your thoughts about political action, charity, that whole thing? Well, I mean, I think we are continuing to bo do both and that there there are some strong synagogues providing um, a really cool interfaith out of the cold program that exists out of St. Matthew's United. And so that's kind of neat because it is, it's incredibly, incredibly multi-faith. Um, but it's, but we get tired and jaded if that's our only focus. And so I think that it, it definitely is the both and uh, an incredible um, Catholic scholar whose name I won't remember, you know, a, a religious 
talked about the two feet of justice and how it, you, there's there's justice and there's charity and that if you're standing on either one or the other you're going to fall over so you need to be engaged engaged in both and what's exciting me is that on the multi-faith side this event is actually the first of three different things that I get to be involved in connected to poverty that the next night on October 17th the newer cultural center is hosting an evening around um, poverty with panelists from the May Tree Foundation, from Women's Habitat, and from the Color of Poverty. And we're hoping to have 200 folks of a variety of faiths join us, learn a bit more, sign postcards, be, be trained to do that. And there's also going to be a multi-faith leaders statement directly to our city council around the poverty issue as we Make lead sure you up hit to the for budget. province of the feds because quite frankly they're far far more capable of responding and have more money um, than the city which relies on our property taxes about all their income and they're strapped um, mainly because of what the province of the feds aren't doing to help yes. out so you know, because I, I, as you were talking about writing to your counselor, I'm thinking your counselor is going to say, yeah, oh, yeah, another one. Like, talk to the province, talk to the federal government. That's yes. where the money is, you know. Um, and we wish they'd do their part, which they, neither is really right now. So that's a real problem on the city. So the city delivers the services, but they don't have the money to pay for them. That's, which is why that the Danforth yeah. multi-faith stuff is focusing on the federal yeah. and different pieces of my work has cool. been focusing on the different levels of government. Because you're right, if we don't work on it all, no one level can make a difference by itself. Yeah. And Karen, you talked about this wonderful, you know, I think it's beautiful, the Eid baskets to delivery to people. And um, and that's, a, that's an amazing, obvious thing to do. But, you know, how do you sort of bridge that gap between the sort of the charity and the, and the action, do you think, in your group? Um, it, it's interesting, that question, though, between the activism and uh, where does it come from? Does it come from the charitable heart from our different Abrahamic religions um, or social justice just from a humanistic point of view um, and what's right? But understanding the system would need to change to really mm -hmm. alleviate these problems. I guess what we focus on is we just keep going. Mm -hmm. I mean, it sounds, it sounds simple, but I, I think... We just try to put our footsteps there every year with several events. We keep meeting. We keep sharing ideas. Um, I hadn't met Beth a few months ago. Mm -hmm. I didn't know about Chew on this. Um, I've never delivered an Eid gift basket. A few years ago, Saida knows we were looking for an event that would interest her community. We wound up doing a cricket event where the Muslim community taught all of us, the Jews and the Christians. Mm -hmm. Of course, there were some from, you know, British backgrounds that knew about cricket, but they taught us how to p Wear play white. cricket. That's all I know. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. And I'm still not quite too sure about how the cricket <laughs> game goes, but it was wonderful, actually, and um, just a memorable thing. To me, it was about just evolving, just keeping doing things together. I, it's the energy of that that I... That I I'm trying to put my faith into because sometimes I just get stalled by all the um, the intellect around that and what mm -hmm. the media is saying and what your no, your yeah. faith beliefs may take you like just do the action. I wonder for your generation, Saida, because there is a difference and um, uh, just you know where faith and social justice kind of what that mix looks like um, because it's a volatile one, right? Um, but like, what are you hearing from your friends? How, how do they engage both the fact that they're Muslim and the fact that they want to do, they want to see the world a better place, especially around poverty issues? Yeah, so uh, with my friends, you know, I can't like a lot of times I have to push them out to come to these mm -hmm. events. Um, they don't have completely the same mindset as I do. Uh, a lot of them do, but then, you know, you got to just push them a little bit. Um, I do know this and um, like I'm studying law and I have have made it a goal of mine um, to in the future because I want to study um, this economic system that was used to eliminate poverty poverty um, and it's religious right it was it was used an economic system that was used to eliminate poverty uh, during Prophet Muhammad's time in Medina um, so I really wanted to study that because the idea behind that was that you know you can't really be at peace until you know your neighbor doesn't you know go to sleep 
full like you know doesn't hasn't ha- doesn't have to go to sleep hungry right and uh and people and i think it's so important and we miss it a lot of times uh in today's day and age is that business right um that even the poor people should be given the opportunity to have some hand in the business that you're doing so you know you they get the opportunity to come up in life instead of the money just going to the top that the money is distributed throughout um so i don't know again you know uh maybe it's because of my time that i'm not that that you know knowledgeable about my religion but it's something that i'm interested in to see um how it worked what they did um because even if you go down in history that was the time that medina that city uh was doing economically was doing really bad and uh it was able to uh you know completely eliminate poverty and i just want to see how that works and even in future as you know as well anything that i do any project that i do i make sure that i help out uh the poor people even with my clothing company that i had to about 2 years ago uh i would donate you know uh 2% of it to uh you know uh to a charity and try to help out so i always incorpor- incorporate that uh into my personal life and what i do well in all of our scriptures there is that idea of uh we call it tithing in christianity but that idea of you give a percentage always back to the community there's always been that that's very biblical yeah. and very quranic um and very you know it comes out of the torah of course originally so um so do you think we need to get back to that i mean this we ties into taxes because really it was the early form of taxation mm-hmm. was that you didn't keep everything you gave something back to the community and um um although you know we want to do more than 10% so <laughs> we want to do more than 10% well, it, <laughs> it i think it's uh on an individual basis right like for me like this is what i want to do whatever i incorporate like whatever work that i do i want to like help out and i think that for everyone it's going to be something different you know it's going to ma- manifest in something you know um into something different for me this is what it is for someone else it's going to be something mm-hmm. else right i think it's amazing um it, we just have a couple of minutes left but just to sum up um and i want to thank uh, you we've had Karen Robbins uh, Said Riaz Beth Baskin um as you said it sounds like a, a joke but it is a christian and a jew and a muslim you know and it, what happens when they come to a radio station and do a show called three women and this is what happened we talked about poverty we talked about how uh grassroots organizing how faiths can actually learn to get along and and learn that yes we all share a lot um uh, and just to sum up so going going forward um you know we're dan for